Okay, um, so good morning, uh, dear mixed colleagues, and good morning, everybody, uh, to our um, to our mini webinar session, which today will be on the impact of trees on poor peels and on some selected ego environmental parameters. And uh, in case you have joined uh, the mixed team uh, recently. Let me please introduce uh, you in brief to the Polish hub, which consists of a scientific partner and a network partner. Um, the academic partner is situated in, in Puławy, in, in the east of Poland. Uh, close, it's quite close to Lublin, and it's represented by Jacek Stalenga and Paweł Tadzikowski. Uh, they will represent um, the results of our innovation study uh, later on. Uh, and our network partner is Juhova Village Project, which is situated in the northwest of Poland. Um, it's in the middle of, uh, if, uh, <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you move from Stettin, which is uh, on the Polish-German border, to Gdańsk, in the middle between those two big cities. Um, okay. Um, if we are talking of Yuhova Village project, we are talking of a quite complex, um, complex institution, which among other things, wants one huge biodynamic farm. Uh, and the most important uh, thing to understand is that there's a foundation in place, Stanisław Kaszłowski Foundation, which is an NGO, and an agricultural company, Spółka Rolnicza Juhawa. And the agricultural company wants a biodynamic farm on behalf of Stanisław Kaszłowski Foundation. Um, there are also some other entities present in place uh, which deal with processing and sales and um, uh, offer workplaces for mentally disabled people um, and so on. But um, as I just mentioned, we should just focus on the two main entities, the foundation and the agricultural company. Um, if we we have uh, a total area of almost 2,000 hectares, uh, which we mainly use for fodder production for our animals, uh, but also for um, for cereal production, seed production, some vegetables, root crops. Uh, there's also a share of woodlands and fallow land. Um, on our farm, we have a, a total of 650 heads of cattle, which is which are dairy cows predominantly, and the young folks like um, calves, heifers, and young bulls. And all of this is accompanied by by um, trees and rows of lines and hedges. Um, in this map you can see how the lines, uh, the, the trees and hedges are arranged uh, in the area which is farmed by Yuhova Village Project. In green you can see um, the lines of trees and in orange you can see uh, the hedges that were established over the last years. <coughs> Our agroforestry uh, activities are limited to planting those trees and, uh, and hedges. Uh, so far we have planted approximately 10 kilometers of, of, well, of trees and hedges. There are some old tree populations in place which were planted by uh, former generations. Uh, we will find them mainly along roads, but um, those trees and hedges that were planted by Yuhova Village Project are quite young. They are only 13 um, to 15 years old. 
So why are, are we doing this at all? Um, we are doing it mainly uh, to achieve some soil protection and protection against wind and water erosion. Um, when the Juhova village project was established in 2001, it has inherited um, quite huge units of fields from the former state farms. And um, one single field can be as big as 60 hectares. Um, so we try to we try to shape this uh, open space and uh, and protect the soil, which is sandy and prone to drought. And yes, it's basically it's prone to drought. By, by planting uh, these trees and, and hedges. But it's also for animal welfare. Um, our cows can find some shadow if it gets too hot or too stormy or too rainy. We can see that they really enjoy uh, the shadow when they are out on the pastures. Uh, we also uh, We also do it for food production and processing. Um, uh, purposes uh, and grow some food and berries and uh, the lime trees also give us some honey for our apiary. Uh, and what we would like to support uh, by trees, by planting trees and hedges is of course biodiversity, not only um, in the, in the um, mm, on the farmland, but also um, in the woodland, which we will find between um, our fields. Um, and similar function, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, and all these functions um, can be um, <laughs> as well important in the whole area, in the whole region of Yuhobo. Uh, so it is something that can be quite easily transferred to other places. It doesn't not it does not need to be limited uh, to Yuhobo farm um, because all the farmers in the region struggle with uh, poor and sandy soil and all the region uh, should be kept as an attractive landscape, um, which is uh, which is attractive for tourists, but also um, offers some uh, support for biodiversity. Uh, and let me point out some challenges that we face. Of course, we face drought uh, in increasing. <laughs> We increasingly struggle with drought over the last years and many trees and bushes uh, die off. Uh, it's a matter of um, of labor, of workforce um, ability, um, of workforce availability, because you need persons who take care of all of this. And uh, well, sometimes we lack this workforce. Uh, we struggle with game, which causes some damage to the fences, to seedlings and young trees. And of course, it takes uh, some money to do this. And sometimes we have difficulties to find financing options. Uh, and one point I would like uh, to point out is that in order to make it all work, you need to have a was responsible person who takes care of all of this. Uh, Hover underwent some substantial restructuring some years ago. It was some six, seven, eight years ago. Some people left, new people came in, and uh, we lost this clear and continuous responsibility for growing and planting trees and bushes. And um, I mean, this is very basic, but at the same time, at the same, same time, it shows how important um, availability of of workforce is. But now, 
uh, we have uh, so the uh, situation has turned to better. We have the perfect person in place who takes care of the trees and hedges and seedlings. And uh, he has established a tree nursery two years ago. It's quite small. It's only 0 0.5 hectares, but it probably will expand to approximately one hectare. And 0 0.5 hectares still is enough for seedlings since they are quite small. Um, uh, this is a solution we would like to suggest uh, also to other farms because it solves so many of our challenges and problems. Uh, it saves uh, money, it saves orga organizational issues. Um, yeah, it just works. <laughs> and uh, I would like to give you some impression of how it looks like. Um, in the left part of this picture, you can see the 0 0.5 of our tree nursery. This is lime tree, two years old lime tree. And here we can see some smaller lime tree. Um, in the front, it's one year old lime tree. In the back, it's two years old. And if you are asking yourself what you can see in this picture, it's, um, well, how to call it, it's, um, baby oaks it's six months old oaks which just have grown from seeds and will grow of course there are many more among uh, this uh, weeds and grow, uh, of oaks among the weeds and they will grow uh, bigger and bigger and one day they will be uh, moved to another place um and i will just finish my part of the presentation, but before I will do this, I would like to give you also another impression which shows how important it is to keep the trees in place and also how difficult it is. Uh, this is drought, this dying of aces, these aces have died from drought. Uh, they used to be, this used to be a beautiful avenue, a double lined avenue three years ago. But every year some trees die off. And this is not a disease, this is just a shortage of groundwater. Uh, and what we can see in this picture, this gives you an impression how it looked like or how it still looks like in those um, sections where we still have this double line avenue. Um, but as you can see on these uh, light colored sandy plots, uh, those plots are places where old big trees used to grow uh, until spring of this year. All of them were cut off because the road will be reconstructed. I mean, this can be justified if you take a closer look at this road, which is really in a quite bad condition. <laughs> but uh, dozens of those um, really old and big trees were cut off and they won't be replaced. And all of this just shows how important it is and how long it takes to, to keep these beautiful um, plants in place. Okay, and now thank you <laughs> for listening to this part of the presentation. I will hand over the presentation to Jacek and Pavel. Okay, thank you very much, Anna. Can you hear me? 
Yes. Uh, I'm very sorry for the technical problems uh, with my computer. That's why I'm using uh, the computer uh, belonging to Pavel. Uh, OK, so um, uh, thank you, Anna, for uh, for this uh, introduction. Uh, do you see my presentation? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, Anna gave you a picture of uh, our case study, our farm in Yuhovo. And now I would like to go deeper into the details and uh, show you the uh, hypothesis, objectives, mm, uh, the design, and the uh, uh, preliminary results on crop productivity from our innovation study. So um, uh, the hypothesis we assumed uh, can be formulated as the that the tree lines uh, uh, in the neighborhood create conditions that can stabilize uh, crop productivity, can improve soil properties and enhance field biodiversity. And based on this hypothesis, we um, we uh, uh, assumed the following uh, objective of our study. So uh, the aim was to evaluate the impact of tree lines of different age, species and architecture on crop yields uh, with parameters soil humidity and temperature and also on the diversity of selected groups of uh, insects, mainly insects. Uh, in the surrounding uh, environment. Uh, as you know, we started our innovation study last year in 2021. Um, our uh, experimental sites were located more or less in the northern part of the farm, uh, and we selected uh, two uh, fields to places. Uh, the first one uh, in, in 2021, it was the field with spelt wheat located in the uh, here, the, the, the soften uh, this red square um, near the young trees, and uh, in the northern part, uh, the field uh, in 2021, the field with uh, buckwheat. Uh, located near um, old trees. And yeah, here is the picture of this spelt wheat uh, located near the line, uh, consisting mainly with the lime, and the height of trees was about four or five uh, meters. And the uh, second field uh, with buckwheat located near the uh, old maple trees. Uh, the height was about um, 10, 12 uh, meters. And these were quite uh, old trees located near the, uh, the road. So this was the last year. In this year, uh, we had to slightly uh, modify our design uh, as far as the first uh, field located near these young trees, it was the same. Uh, in this year, it was winter barley. Uh, as far as the second field uh, located near the old trees, we had to move it a little because the old trees located in the previous year, uh, unfortunately, because of the renovation of the road, some of the trees were cut uh, down. That's why we had to move a little. In this year, uh, we uh, had uh, oat uh, in this field near old trees, and this is the picture of this uh, oat uh, with um, uh, near 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 the uh, old trees. Okay, so coming to the design, uh, so um, we um, uh, our design consisted of uh, three. Uh, lines uh, located uh, more or less uh, in uh, 
a distance that was equal uh, to the um, height of the trees. So the first line was more or less the uh, the height of the trees. The next was twice uh, height of the trees, and the third one was three times longer than the height uh, of the trees. And within each line, uh, we uh, set up uh, three uh, monitoring uh, uh, points. So for this uh, young three lines, we had five meters, 10 meters and 15 meters. And for this old three line, we had 10, 20 and 30 uh, meters. OK, so what kind of parameters uh, we took into account? So first of all, crop productivity. Uh, wheat uh, parameters, uh, soil temperature and soil moisture, earthworm density and insect diversity. As far as soil temperature and moisture and insect diversity, this will be presented by my colleague uh, Pavel. Uh, I will present you briefly the crop yields and weeds. Uh, as far as the um, earthworm density, we do not have the results just because uh, we did not detect uh, any earthworms in our samples. It was, I think, one, two individuals. So uh, we could say that uh, because of a quite um, a poor sandy uh, soils and uh, also the uh, not so uh, quite dry conditions, we did not detect any earthworms. But coming to the uh, crop productivity, so first the results from the last year, and uh, you see quite uh, interesting results. So for the spelt wheat, where we had these young trees, we observed the highest, the largest yields uh, in the closest distance to the trees. Uh, for the straw and for the grain yield, this was the highest, and the a longer distance from the field uh, line, the lower yields. The opposite situation was for the buckwheat, uh, which was located near the old trees. Here we have the uh, longer distance from, from the tree line, the larger, larger uh, yields, uh, both uh, straw and grain yields. Uh, as far as the uh, weeds are concerned, uh, here um, the results maybe are not so consistent with the um, crop yields. Here we have to say that uh, first of all the spelt wheat was uh, very uh, weedy, especially at, uh, at least uh, in, 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 the, in, in the monitoring points. So you see quite a high amount of uh, dry matter of uh, weeds uh, and also in the number of weeds. So here we observe that the uh, smallest uh, weed biomass and the number of weeds, weeds was located uh, uh, in the longest distance from the tree line. The situation was definitely better for buckwheat, which is uh, uh, famous because of its competitive abilities um, against wheat. That's why the wheat biomass was uh, definitely uh, uh, smaller than for the spelt wheat. Uh, and here there were no so big differences between uh, our three lines. And also at this moment, I, uh, as a final uh, slide, I would like to show you uh, preliminary results uh, from this year only for oat. And uh, so the, the field located near the old trees, the results we obtained um, are not so clear, convincing, I mean, not so consistent with the results obtained uh, last year. Here we received the highest yields uh, in the second line. Uh, um, uh, and uh, it was consistent with the wheat biomass, where was the smallest. Uh, for the first line and the third line, the grain yield was more or less uh, similar. Uh, 
So we did not do uh, at this moment any statistical analysis. We will we are going to do this when when we will have uh, all three years of the results. So the next year will be the, the, the last year of our innovation study. OK, so this is all what uh, at this moment I wanted to show you. Uh, and now I share the screen to Pavel, who will present you the environmental results from our innovation study. Uh, thank you, Jarek. Uh, I think um, I will show you a little bit of supplementation of this data. I try to find a way to share this screen. Oh, because this screen was already shared, sorry. Mm. Uh, can you see presentation? Yeah, yeah. Is a uh, full screen mode? Uh, it was gone. Uh, it, it, it it's full screen or just uh, you see, can see conspect? Yeah, it's, it's not it's not full screen. Okay. OK, if you go to slideshow, that should be OK. Uh, how about now? You can, yeah, it's not. It's not full? Not full, no. Um, you can read it, though. But uh, you try again. Well, that's better. OK, maybe. Maybe now is it full? It's still with conspect, yes? Yeah, it's, it's still, it's not, it's not on in the moment, actually. OK, so let's mm -hmm. just continue. Uh, uh, we take opportunity because we already have uh, mm, uh, soil equipment for uh, measuring uh, humidity and uh, the temperature from another project and the license was uh, expiring already so uh, we decided to use it in uh, this uh, uh, this monitoring uh, the way how uh, this uh, detector was measuring uh, soil parameters was uh, in every hour uh, like constantly uh, taking uh, the samples and uh, at the end I uh, just pu put it to the lever of the uh, one date and the, the that was uh, two sensors one on the 50 uh, 15 centimeters deep another in the 35 today I will present only this uh, shallow depth results uh, the registrator was totally digged in the soil, so it uh, was not disturbing uh, the agriculture, uh, the agronomic treatments of the field. Uh, I also uh, set up uh, the biodiversity uh, monitoring, uh, which was consisting in 2021 of uh, yellow bowls, uh, free samples in every uh, distance from the trees. Uh, supplemented by sweep netting, uh, two samples uh, for every distance. Uh, in uh, SPED, uh, 
where the trees were, were relatively young, uh, we uh, take all of these uh, samples in distance of 5, 10 and 50 meters, which was like multiple distance uh, of uh, the tree uh, height. Uh, we found out that uh, the moisture of the soil was uh, constantly and statistically uh, um, significantly uh, higher and then on the uh, proximity of the trees, uh, which was quite a surprise because we expect trees uh, to uh, consume uh, some part of the water. Um, also, the angle of the uh, um, sunshine in the summer in Poland is like 60 degrees, so we cannot ac uh, expect uh, trees to give a shade to five or 10 meters from uh, the tree stands. If tree have, for example, 10 meters of height uh, in the middle of the summer, shade is only like three, five meters. So uh, the factor was actually probably the breaking the wind who is uh, drying out the soil. So uh, the humidity of the soil was decreasing when we moved uh, to the, um, to the, uh, uh, field center, so we are pretty happy of this result. And also we find out uh, the the big difference, uh, the significant difference between temperatures of the soil at the depth of 15 centimeters in uh, those distances. Of course, the lowest was the uh, near the trees. That was actually probably the result of the higher humidity, which uh, is cooling the soil and uh, that was uh, steadily increasing to the um, way of the middle of the field but 50 meters is not that uh, not that, that far actually from the trees and the field edge but the difference in the temperatures was pretty big and pretty not noticeable uh, as the, for the diversity of the uh, studied insects uh, we of course find out uh, Further from the uh, trees, the number, average number of uh, species uh, slightly decreased, and uh, but the number of insect individuals increased. And what is interesting, we also find out that 50 meters from the trees, the farthest distance, the diversity of the insects was the highest. Um, we cannot uh, draw conclusions from this for now because the distance was relatively small, the trees were uh, young, and we also have to remember this is the biodynamic organic system uh, wheat, which is very weedy and is very uh, di diverse. So uh, any modification of this system, like introducing trees, will not uh, have this much effect on this system. It would have effect on the conventional intensive production, I guess. Uh, another parameters, we find out that the number of pest uh, species, herbivore uh, species, increase uh, away from the trees. And the number of the natural enemies decreases from the trees. And also, what was uh, surprising for me, uh, the number of pollinators is actually much decreased in, in, with the distance from the trees, especially is surprising because the 50 meters is a small distance, but the difference is uh, noticeable. I've got to say all these correlations uh, and uh, if we use uh, tests to compare, statistical tests to compare these results, will not show statistical differences because we uh, did have uh, too few of the samples but every of the samples is very uh, labor in intensive so we try to increase them but it, it, it is not a none is it will be not easy uh, the second uh, spot uh, back with cultivation uh, in proximity of the old uh, mature trees, uh, the samples were taken in the uh, bigger distances, 10, 20 and 30 meters. 
and other uh, parameters were the same. Uh, we found out uh, that the, in the proximity of the trees, the 10 meters from the trees, uh, humidity was uh, lower than the middle distance. But the lowest humidity of the soil was, of course, in the middle of the fields, 30 meters from the trees. The conclusion is, of course, that uh, trees in the, in the first distance consume a part of the water. So, of course, this, this is also reason why the yields were the lowest in the proximity of the trees. But uh, the 20 meters from the trees, the humidity is uh, satisfactory for this kind of soils. And of course, in the 30 meters, the middle of the field is the frying pan, the sun totally and the wind totally dries the soil. Uh, same case for the temperature. Uh, the temperature uh, was one degree, uh, temperature of the soil, of course, was one degree lower in the distance of the 10 and 20 meters in compared to the distance of the 30 meters. So temperature was identical in the first two distances, of course, not because of Shea, but other uh, effects of the trees. So we compare this observation. Uh, when and we if we take all of these uh, samples from all days, uh, differences are um, significant uh, in statistic matter. Uh, of course, we get the same results uh, about uh, arthropods, insects. The number of taxa dropped in the direction from the trees and uh, also number of individuals was lower in the middle of the field and also diversity index compared these observations and we have to say uh, the buckwheat is a totally different crop than uh, cereal because it's very uh, dense so it uh, prohibits uh, weeds and uh, some arthropods of uh, spreading into the field. Uh, what was also uh, uh, compared the number of the pest species, pest, pests of specifically of the buckwheat uh, increases with the distance uh, from the trees and number of the natural enemies drops dramatically in in the way of the field and uh, what is also so but what is surprising uh, the number of pollinators drops from the trees is surprising for me because the buckwheat is uh, very uh, mm, honey uh, producing uh, plant it uh, provides a lot of food for the pollinators and i expect actually opposite uh, result uh, so from my side, it's uh, uh, it's uh, it's uh, all. Uh, thank you for attention. I have uh, I'll be happy to answer questions if there are any. Um, yes, Jarek and uh, Paweł, there are two questions posed by Holger in the chat. I don't know if you had the opportunity to read them. Uh, I can also ex explain the questions, okay. maybe that's easier. I just wrote them so that I don't forget. <laughs> so the first question was about the the 2021 data where we had this, you showed this one table where at one point the highest yield and the less weeds, etc. were very close and they are on the other hand very far away from the trees, on the old trees. Now my question would be how much of this difference along the transects or the, the distance to the trees is actually due to the trees or rather due to eventual other uh, yeah other factors like uh, soil nutrients uh, and so on do you know anything about that because i think it will be very hard to actually put this these effects on the trees by themselves Uh, no, Jarek, we cannot hear you. I have to invite you to my microphone. Uh, 
Okay. Oh. Now it's fine. Now it's fine. Okay. Okay, so a very good question. Um, uh, I think, uh, as you can see on this map I showed, um, you could observe the high variability uh, of the soil quality. In, in general, the soil in both fields were quite uh, poor, but uh, we had some, let's say, better islands. Uh, so, uh, so perhaps we did not uh, detect uh, uh, the uh, nutrients. Uh, uh, we did not do any nutrient analysis in these places. Uh, we have uh, uh, we have the result for the general field in terms of the nutrients, but we do not do we didn't do any analysis in this strict line. So we don't know uh, the real effects of uh, lack of nutrients. But I think in this case uh, the conditions were quite uh, similar anyway. So uh, the effect of trees, especially these old trees. Uh, were, were uh, significant. Um, uh, maybe for these younger trees, there, there might be additional important uh, effect connected with the uh, presence of the uh, small, um, small uh, 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 roof. Uh, um, uh, Pavel, how is range. range? Yeah, uh, not far away from from the from the opposite side of the uh, trees. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think for this uh, for this uh, field with old trees, uh, I would say the one of the key uh, factors were the presence of 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 the tree line. All right, thanks. And should I just go directly to my other question, maybe? <laughs> sure. Um, you showed the, the first graph of the soil humidity. Um, I was just wondering because I uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's it looked like you had the jump. Uh, yeah, exactly. Th this is you had these jumps at 10 meters distance, but the others at five and 15 don't show these jumps. Do you know? Or how would you explain it? Do you have some, I don't know, clay lenses there, or why are these jumps there and not at the other distances? Uh, yes, uh, th this is uh, the actually simple answer for this. Uh, I do these monitorings for years now, and usually you see this jump. Of course, always you see this jump after the huge rainfall. And uh, usually the jump is high in the uh, shallow uh, part of the soil and is pretty flat in the depth of the soil. The thing, first uh, uh, thought is we mixed up the, uh, the depths, but that was not the case, I got to say. Uh, the truth is uh, we usually see these jumps higher if the uh, soil is bare. So if the crops was small, uh, for example, in this case, in the spelt, it seems like in this spot uh, was a smaller vegetation than the others for some reason. Maybe uh, I don't remember the results from the yield and the biomass, but uh, probably in this spot uh, or the sometimes the soil have a different uh, texture if it's uh, too leaky, like too sandy, too gravel. It can you see these jumps, but I believe it is mostly because of vegetation, because vegetation stops part of the rain, and the same case uh, for the uh, buckwheat. Uh, you can see in the middle the biomass was the biggest, so it uh, took some uh, rainfall on the leaves or just use it uh, more quickly? I don't know. OK, thank you. Is 
Can I just ask two questions, please? Uh, what first, first one to Anna. Th first of all, thanks very much for presentations, everyone. That was that's actually really interesting and actually really important as well. Some of the results are we're getting from this. Um, just firstly to Anna, um, you mentioned it's a biodynamic farm, uh, Jacobo. Is this is there a, a large hectareage of biodynamic farms in Poland? And is this is this typical of biodynamic farms with the, the mixture of trees and hedges, etc.? Uh, no, this is not typical. <laughs> it is not typical at all. And um, we have some students of agriculture uh, who visit Juhova for a traineeship almost every year. And three years ago, we had a student of agriculture from uh, from Germany, and he wrote a short article for our annual report. Can you run a biodynamic farm which is as big as you have? Yeah. Uh, can you run it under biodynamic uh, conditions and under biodynamic principles? And his answer to this question, which is also my answer to this question is, yes, you can do it. Uh, it's not a matter of, of acreage. It's not a matter of size, but it is a matter of, of management and organization, which gets more and more difficult the bigger a farm is. Yeah. Uh, we have, you may rem remember from one of my first slides that we have 150 employees, approximately 150 employees, which is quite a lot. Yeah. And there are people who are responsible for animal husbandry, there are those who are responsible for uh, um, uh, for the arable part of uh, the farm. There are those who are responsible for processing and for sales and for educational activities and so on. And the more of sections you have, the better you need to coordinate uh, all these sections, mm. uh, which is really challenging. Yeah, but there are also advantages to this um, to this big size of farm, from my point of view, because agriculture in general suffers from a lack of um, of labor force, mm. and uh, if you have such a big, well, let's call it business. If you have such a big farm and you have so many employees, there's always some um, possibility to take a week or two weeks off you can go on vacation if you get ill you know yeah. that there will be always someone in place who can replace you and uh, you don't have this burden of a mm. family farm on your own uh, you can you can share the you can share the yeah, duties yeah. yes you can share the burden you can share the duties uh, which is, uh, it feels a little bit more like a usual job uh, than all the dedication you have to give to a smaller farm or a family yeah. farm yeah. where you are all on your own. Uh, so this is an advantage to uh, of, um, of this big size farms. But in fact, uh, yes, it requires, it takes a lot of time for consulting, exchange of, uh, well, state of the art, uh, yeah. what should we do next among all these sections um, of the farm. Yeah. I'm not sure if that was your, yeah, yeah, that no, answers that, that's, your that's question. A, yeah, mm -hmm. no, that's interesting. I mean, I just, I, I wasn't too sure just how, it's not common that was there. That, that, thanks for that. Just, just before the Jim's got a question as well. Just, just, just really just a comment actually. Uh, one thing that's come come out from from all, all three of you with regard to the, the project is 
the, the effect of trees and crop growth is quite a complex story <laughs> by from from the results so far and I mean hopefully you can continue this work because I think with the interest in agroforestry throughout Europe now it's a the first question any farmer is going to ask is uh, but this is going to have a detrimental effect it's going to have a negative effect on crop growth the, the results of this so far show that's not necessarily the case but it is a, is a very complex story so hopefully the, the work can continue on for a prolonged period so again thanks very much for, for that yeah. I'll hand you over to uh, Jim. You know, yes, Jim has raised his hand. Yeah, yeah. yeah, well, thank you. Well, first of all, thanks to uh, Anna, Yarek and Pavel for your presentation. It was really enjoyable and I appreciate English is not your first language. So well done. Congratulations. You know, agroforestry, as, as David said, is, is really important. Sorry, I'm based in Scotland in the UK, so that's my context, really. I wanted just a few questions. The first one, and probably it's more to Anna, are there any incentives, any grants available to farmers to plant trees and hedges in in Poland? So that's my first question. And then like Hogar, I was interested in that, which is in Yarek's, I was interested in the, the key thing is the yields. What's the impact on the yields? So I was interested in that table on the yield. So, I was interested to understand the differences in the yields and so the parameters would one of the parameters I don't know if you did actually consider that is disease because disease in 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 cereals wheat you know there's uh, mildews rust eye spots you know that's going to clearly be a factor so I wondered if if, if disease in there and I, and I guess my final one is really at the end of the day if we're going to convince farmers about the benefits of agroforestry it has to be commercial. There has to be commercial advantages. So, will you at the end of the three years are you going to tr try and tie all this into a com commercial? You know, a, provide some evidence that there's financial, commercial, financial benefit to, to integrate the land with with trees. Because, for example, just in context, in in the UK, most farmers are not keen to plant good land and trees um, because the, the the cost the impact on the land value that's the key barrier is the impact on the land value because the media you plant trees it restricts in terms of future use of that land and d diminishes the capital land value so it affects their balance sheet and the value of their farm that is a main barrier in the uk so sorry, that's a long, long-winded. Sorry about that. The first one: Are there grants? Any grants? Any incentives for farmers in Poland to plant trees, hedges? Um, there will be some in the forthcoming financing period, which will start in two thousand and twenty-three. Although maybe Jarek and Pavel can help me, I don't know exactly how they would will, will look like. But there are some parts of the second pillar of the cap that the uh, member states can decide on themselves. And in the last uh, financing period, Poland unfortunately decided uh, to leave out agroforestry. So there was no financial support at all uh, uh, for farmers. But this will change in the next financing period. So I. As I said, I don't know the details. Um, and yes, I think the, uh, the situation is quite similar uh, to the situation in the UK. Of course, it should be beneficial in commercial terms to farmers to, to plant these trees. And very often it's these activities are beneficial, but not for the farmer, him or herself but it's rather beneficial for the region or for society in the region. There are so many people who visit Yuhova and say, oh, it's so beautiful here. And really it is beautiful. So it, it supports touristic activities and those touristic activities support economy in the region. But this is not something the farmer can benefit from. Uh, quite the opposite. 
it may be even uh, uh, it may even generate uh, additional costs to the farm and uh, hopefully they will be uh, the next financing period and uh, the supporting measures will even out uh, those uh, well, those ex those expenses. Uh, Jacek, Pavel, do you know the details of agroforestry starting from 2023? Anna, Anna, it's OK. I, I don't need okay. to know the details. Mm -hmm, that's, mm -hmm, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Maybe just to save time, maybe Jarek, if uh, in terms of the trying to, I'm trying to understand the impact on, on the yields that you presented that table. So is disease, do you think disease is a factor, you know, one of those variables that's impacting that we need to measure? Uh, yeah, I, I, I totally agree that the, the, the diseases level, especially fungi diseases of, of leaves, uh, is, is, a, is a problem in organic farming systems. As uh, we just do this uh, research in uh, other experiments in our institute for many, many years. In this case, uh, we didn't do any disease uh, this, uh, analysis. Uh, for for buckwheat, it's not a, usually it's not a problem. Uh, also for oats, um, for spelt wheat, it, it might be, and for, for barley as well. Uh, but I think uh, the uh, uh, the level would be more or less uh, similar in uh, uh, all these three lines we we, we we took into account in our experiments. We, uh, when we when we uh, were taking the samples, we did, did not observe any significant uh, intensity of diseases, but yeah, for sure they existed and uh, in, to some extent uh, impacted the, the final crop yield. But we did not do any precise uh, measurements of the disease level. Okay, if you. I can add something, actually I do uh, plant disease monitoring in other projects and we didn't think uh, about this. Do you think, David, it can be differences in the different distances from the trees or in the different systems? David, do you think? Do, do you think uh, it could be different in the different distances, actually? With regard to, sorry. In regard to the plant diseases. Is it, well, well, probably not an expert on that, but it probably, I would imagine because humidity is kind of a major impact on plant disease. And I think, well, the results are in the, certainly soil humidity and soil moisture. It indicate the overall humidity is going to be different. Air humidity is going to be different, so that will have an impact. Okay. On okay. Diseases. So I, all, I, all, almost certainly there will be an impact. I can. I think I can do this, and it, we have a lot of samples, and we relatively easy uh, yeah. sampling to com compare what we are already doing. So ne yeah. next year, I think we can show. That, yeah, that would that would be really interesting because I'm not again as Jim says the disease again any farmers could ask what's the, what's the impact going to be on disease of the crop oh. uh, in proximity. So I think that's worth measuring. Yeah, uh, this is actually interesting because uh, I do uh, serial diseases uh, since uh, 2018 and we do uh, all uh, serial uh, every uh, 12 varieties and uh, different systems. Uh, what we actually see, uh, the resilience depends on the variety, actually. Uh, sometimes uh, on, um, on the rotation, yeah. of course, uh, but especially about the weather. Yeah. Uh, if you have like prolonged drought followed by sudden rain, mm -hmm. we have a lot of disease, but if we have like rainfall very even in the uh, season, uh, plants in organic culture actually are pretty healthy. Oh, okay. But, so uh, it's usually, I mean, it's, it's the weather actually. Yeah, but it's interesting. I think almost certainly you're, you're producing a microclimate on, beside the trees, which will again is going to have an impact. On, well, it's showing already showing it's having an impact on growth, or an impact on disease as well. Again, I think I think that's one. It'd be terrific if you could actually extend this over 
beyond the three year period. So you can have years, you know, so different weather conditions, etc., and the impact on disease. Well, we already lost two years, but next yeah. year I will do this. Well, we no hope. problem. <laughs> Anna, did you have a? Yes, if I may add something else to Jim's uh, question on um, profitability of of uh, planting trees and hedges, maybe it depends on how you look at the profitability and uh, what kind of agriculture you you have. Uh, we know a an organic farmer from uh, from the south of Poland, uh, Marcin Wojcik, I think uh, Jarek and Paweł know him very well. He's an organic farmer and he keeps cattle and he has established a very beautiful and also effective grid of, uh, of uh, fences. I think it's from willow, or it's either it's willow or it's poplar tree. Uh, and although he didn't get any financial support for it, he just did it. He did it himself and he could save some money for establishing uh, another kind of fences for his cattle. So it depends on how you see it. Uh, maybe you can see some profitability in it, even if there's no support for it, if it fits into your concept and it, if it fits to your farm. But of course, in order to have more of it, uh, there should be some more obvious incentives to, to do it. Yeah, thanks very much. Is there any other question? We're just we're beginning to run out of time now. Um, mm. I just wonder if there's any other pressing questions. Otherwise, we may have to sort of come to an end. OK, you know, well, I, all that's left for me to, to, to thank you uh, very much, Yarek, Pavel and Anna. That's been a really interesting. I think it's quite provoked. Prov 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 you've probably raised more questions than you've answered, actually. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that's, uh, that's what science is about. Um, yes, again, thank, thank you again very much. And we'll, we'll obviously we'll all be keeping in touch anyway and we'll see progress in, on your project. Thank you again and thank you everyone for, for joining. Okay. Super. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you, David. Thank, 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 thank you. See you next week.